Good morning. I'm Gord Long with the Financial Repression Authority. As part of our ongoing guest series on financial repression, I have Jeff Davis joining us this morning. Jeff is Managing Director of Mercer Capital's Financial Institutions Group. Welcome, Jeff. Glad to be here. Jeff, I thought we'd start with uh, you giving a brief overview of your backgrounds. A lot of our listeners may not be familiar with yourself and Mercer Capital, if you could. Yeah, so I'm a longtime observer of the commercial banking scene. I bank began my career at AmSouth Bank in Alabama, which is now one of the legacy companies that forms Regions Financial, one of the super regionals in the U.S., and have uh, spent years as a sell-side analyst covering banks and specialty finance companies, um, including for uh, firms such as Guggenheim, FTN Financial, and J.C. Bradford. But, uh, but in any event, and then uh, in uh, three years ago, in 2012, I joined Mercer Capital, and we are a valuation and financial advisory firm, and we work primarily with private equity as well as institutions, family wealth offices, and the like. And the, uh, the overall theme of what we work on is valuation or related, uh, maybe something related to capital structure, mostly for privately held institutions. So, but in any event, for me and my career, it has been about observing commercial banks and specialty finance companies. So uh, topics like financial repression are, are certainly uh, impact what we look at and how we think about it. Jeff, one of the reasons that we wanted to talk to you was specifically about uh, financial repression as it impacts the uh, U.S. banks. Could you discuss with us what your views are on what financial repression is before we discuss the banks? Uh, in the, I'm, gonna, I'm going to lift from James Grant, uh, who said it better, and that is it's, it's a price control. And, and in terms of the Fed and central banks globally setting short-term rates at zero, or in the case of Europe and the Nordic countries, below zero, it's simply a price control uh, that as it relates to all facets of the economy, both the financial and the Main Street, Main Street economy has profound impact. And um, it's, uh, it's something that's going to play out over the years, maybe even the decades. I think we've really just seen the beginning of the, of the impact, if you will, from, from repression. Our work suggests policies of financial repression will be with us for a protracted period of time. The macroprudential policies will take various forms as policies and regulatory actions are implemented to continue to support and ensure low interest rates and higher levels of inflation. But these actions will continue to push financial institutions further out in, on the risk curve. The point being, this isn't going to yeah. go away anytime soon. Agreed, and we very much see that in the financial system, even within a generic commercial bank. Let's talk about what this means to the U.S. banking system, or banking sector now and in the um, in the future. You brought some slides on this that I would that would be a good foundation to guide our discussion. Could you step us through them? Yeah, sure. So, from a commercial bank perspective. Maybe even before going to the business model is thinking about three cycles. There's the uh, the credit cycle, there is the business cycle, and then there is the rate cycle, and they're all overlaid. Gordon, it might uh, if we argue which comes first. Well, it's sort of a chicken and an egg thing. They all interact, and the banks, if you will, straddle all three in terms of being a key, not the only, but a key allocator of capital in the U.S. economy in terms of lending deposits back into the Main Street economy as well as to Wall Street. So in any event, financial repression impacts at, at a very base level the rate cycle, if you will, but there are implications for both the credit cycle and the business cycle, and that uh, flows through to into the banking system. I, I tell Jeff, my experience has been sure. that most investors don't think of cycles in this manner, specifically equity investors. I know for a fact credit and bond yeah, investors I, do. 
Yeah, oh, I, I would agree, and and I would um, maybe because I covered banks and, for instance, at Mercer, probably twenty percent of the, my time is spent looking at debt securities, not just equity securities. Is particularly for public equity investors, the focus is really on what is a given company going to make next quarter, next year, maybe two years out, and it's it's really that dynamic of growth which speaks a little bit more to maybe what's going on in the Main Street economy and that dynamic in terms of what is going to drive a company's earnings or cash flow above what expectations are or below that when the bond market may very well be signaling that the economy is on the cusp of slowing down dramatically as was the case in 2006, in late 2006 and into 2007 when the 10-year yield was sitting pretty much on top of the two-year yield, and that was a sign that the Fed was behind the curve and the economy was getting ready to slow. In the equity markets, it took really the Bear Stearns event in the summer of 07 when their hedge funds failed, which, by the way, were credit-related or credit-focused funds for the equity markets to really start to focus on what the corporate bond market had started to take notice on, I would say, nine months earlier, going back into late 06. You have a chart on commercial banks that differentiates between lending to Main Street and Wall Street and the difference between deposit flows and payment systems. Yeah, so this is um, this is a, uh, a chart that I, uh, I, I do a class each year. SNL has a bank analyst training program, and this is one of my basic charts. It, it may seem straightforward, but I put it, put it out there because I, I think when maybe individuals think about banks, there's not a full understanding of how they function, what the business model is. And you say banks or banks are generically thrown in, uh, in the lexicon um, in the media. There is an association with Wall Street, and that's certainly an aspect, but at core function if you and I formed a bank, and let's say we put in $100 of capital that's on the right-hand side of the balance sheet, and we have $100 of cash on the left-hand side, our objective in time is to leverage that, and we take in deposits. We have a fractional uh, fractional deposit system in this country, as, as we have globally, and I think historically that goes back to the Dutch, maybe in the uh, 1600s, when that was really more formalized. But in any event, the deposits are lent out and we build a balance sheet that in time should consist of cash, some bonds, and then primarily loans, and those would be our earning assets, and then they're funded with deposits, maybe a little bit of debt, and then our original equity capital. So the objective for a bank is to earn a spread on the assets, the loans being the highest yielding assets with a little bit more risk, the bonds less so, and then the cash even uh, less risk, and uh, certainly these days is a non-earning asset. So the bank's role in the economy is to take the deposits and prudently, but, 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 but still take risk and lend the money into the economy, into the Main Street economy, and that helps finance the economy. So the banks are really, uh, the, in a sense, Gordon, they really are special uh, to be segregated from commerce, and they straddle this this uh, um, as a, a capital allocator in the economy. And then the overlay is the credit cycle and what's going on in the Main Street economy and then the rate cycle. Now, you have on this chart the uh, shadow banking system up here in the top right-hand corner. How does the shadow banking system well, play in? Well, I, 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 let's uh, let me loosely say that banks have approximately thirty percent of the credit outstanding, or about thirty percent of the credit in the U.S. system sits on a bank balance sheet. And maybe if we went back to the time of the depression, my guess is that number was probably sixty-five, seventy percent. But during the last bit, last several decades, the shadow banking system has developed as an alternative lender, as well as an alternative place for you and me and others to place money. So a very simple example would be a money market fund. A money market fund could be considered part of the shadow banking system where we may place funds outside of the banking system and then the money market makes fairly safe or very safe 
short-term loans, for instance, in the corporate commercial paper market. But in any event, the shadow banking system is separate from the commercial banking system, but is a very large piece of the credit allocator today, and to some extent is dependent on banks for some funding, although shadow banks look to the wholesale markets for much of the funding. So maybe stepping back from uh, and thinking about the changes since the financial crisis, I, I don't think there was a great appreciation among regulators, investors, that how big the shadow banking system had become. And so uh, we, we really saw more issues in the shadow banking system first, and then they spilled over into the traditional banking system. So some of the regulatory changes we've had since the financial crisis have been geared to make the banks um, uh, much more able to withstand a shock, primarily through holding more capital, probably not a bad thing. But at the same time, a lot of the risk has been pushed out of the commercial banking system, and it resides now in the shadow banking system, where it's not as, it's more opaque, not as transparent as perhaps looking at a commercial bank. The explosion in securitization with the growth in asset-backed securities to finance auto loans, mortgage-backed securities to finance housing, Sally May's credit, uh, collateralized loan obligations to finance student loans, etc., are all about the creation of credit. But this debt growth still isn't, e is still isn't even enough. And now we hear renewed talk of helicopter money, or OMF, uh, overt monetary finance, what does that terminology mean to you, and is it a realistic possibility? Yeah, well, I, when uh, so for helicopter money, in a sense, we've uh, maybe we've seen it since the financial crisis with quantitative easing. But when I think of helicopter money now, I think about a few of the a few of we're starting to see in the financial media, not not maybe the main. Main Street media in terms of during the next downturn or crisis, uh, be it central banks or the governments that are financed directly by central banks now, of placing money directly into citizens' bank accounts. And uh, it's uh, maybe uh, too clever, uh, if you will, but there's, uh, there's a simplicity in that if, if if one believes in that type of monetary policy and that it bypasses Wall Street and institutions such as, not that they're institutions per se, but segments of the financial economy such as the shadow banking system in terms of trying to inject money directly into Main Street economy where the hope is it'll be spent and create a multiplier effect. Uh, my, my guess is that uh, it's too clever, it won't work, it's, it's part of this something for nothing scheme that much of what uh, maybe that would be another way to describe financial repression as something for nothing. Uh, but in any event, that's what I think about helicopter money is, is uh, I get a check from the IRS directly. Let me, and Gordon, before, I've, before I forget, uh, in, in terms of thinking about financial repression and, and the banks, I remember in... Uh, Early 2009, I was calling on a portfolio manager at Goldman Sachs, and uh, this person worked small caps. And my beat was primarily small caps and mid-cap financials, which, I, which has always been my passion as opposed to being the 33rd analyst on Bank of America, which I've covered in the past. But this person had told me that she had just met with their Japanese team and part of their dialogue was what do zero rates mean for the banks? And the Japanese team that responded to this U.S. person was it's a two-handle on that interest margins. And, and the point was going back 20 years, and I know the, Central, the uh, Bank of Japan raised rates uh, when? In 2000, maybe 98. They, they tried to get off the dime a couple times, and, and obviously that didn't work. But in any event, over a couple decades, the net interest margin at the Japanese banks had been significantly eroded. And so it just got me to thinking in terms of our banks, my view was at the time as it is today, they're stuck, whether they raise rates one or two times, the system's stuck. And as a result, 
the spread, we'll see in the U.S. banks what's happened in the Japanese banks, and that is the net interest margins over time will compress dramatically. It doesn't, you know, it doesn't necessarily mean quarter to quarter, and each balance sheet can have different nuances, but over time, it's going to be a much lower net interest margin. I apologize. I, I think I took us away from the, the slides that you uh, you brought with you. Yeah. So um, the uh, well, it has mattered in a couple places. So financial repression. If you think about zero rates today, it's very painful for an institution to hold cash. So there is, I think, significant risk taking occurring among commercial banks in terms of taking additional credit risk as well as additional duration risk. And that could be in a commercial real estate loan or it could be in the bond portfolio. But structurally, banks are in a spread on their assets relative to the deposits and borrowings that fund those assets. If you think about a traditional commercial bank where maybe 20 to 30 percent of the deposits are not interest bearing deposits, when short term rates are four or five percent, the spread is really good, particularly on the non interest bearing deposit side. When rates are as low as they are today, the non interest bearing deposit franchise is really devalued. And for a business model like a shadow bank system that may borrow money in the repo market at 30 days, 90 days, 180 days, 180 days, um, that, that scenario works in terms of their funding zero. But so for the commercial bank, having cash sit around um, that is funded with deposit, that, that yields nothing, the deposits, the cost of funds are close to zero, there's a real incentive to push the money out into assets with yield, just just like we see with individuals who may have used to have been investors in money markets, short-term bond funds and CDs, they've been pushed out the risk curve. The same thing is occurring with commercial banks. And so there's more risk taking in terms of uh, the uh, credit and duration. I've got a, a number of bankers have commented to me that memories are short. They're seeing the behaviors they were seeing in 05, 06, maybe for different reasons this time. And also should note that maybe the rate regime is not any different than it was in 2012, but as we've gotten further into this, what I think is recovery, it's, it's hardly robust, but it has been a recovery, is the willingness now that we're three, four years in to take much more risk as it's rising across the system. So, uh, but in any event, the banks, so that's one place the banks were impacted. Secondly, as it relates to credit, the financial repression has artificially pumped up asset values. Commercial real estate's a good example. I've got a slide in there which shows commercial real estate values going back to 2000. They really pivoted uh, back when, four or five years ago in about 2010, and with the reduction in rates, when we think about commercial real estate, it's the long-term rates, present value of cash flows go up. Well, banks lend against that. And so there's additional risk in the system now that asset values are pumped up and what may be a prudent loan with, let's say, a 60 or 70% loan to value, um, if the assets doubled in value, over the last four or five years, the margin of safety is, is just not there. So that's another place where financial repression impacts banks as well as the financial system um, generally. And then there, there are other places, the bond portfolios, if rates were really to move up, there would be huge losses in the bond portfolios. Now, I'm in the camp that given the soup we're in, that any spike up in, let's say, the 10-year here in the U.S. is likely likely to be temporary. But in any event, that's another place there, there has been risk. And, um, uh, and then lastly on financial repression and how it impacts the banks is this reach for yield, cash is trash. It also means the marginal credit is a credit that a lender can take a chance on. So there are a number of zombie companies that would have failed in pick your year 2009 or 2010 
that we're given a new lifeline. And companies don't go broke because they don't make money. And the same would be true for a nonprofit or a government entity. Entities go broke when they have no liquidity. So what zero rates has done is push liquidity into the system. Presently, we're seeing it in the shale oil structure in terms of companies with uh, with uh, inadequately capitalized companies, heavily indebted, were able to borrow money, and now we're seeing the piper to be paid with that, which will be losses taken in 2016 and 2017 as that as that sector sorts itself out. That has gone on all over the economy. But until we have the next downturn, eh, the loans will be rolled and we won't see the losses. Credit is, is always, uh, but also borrowing from Jim Grant, is credit is forever cyclical. And we're on the swing where uh, credit metrics are good. And I will tell you this, what I we work with banks all over the country. And what we're seeing, though, is among community banks, is loan demand is, in some markets, it's spotty. In other markets, it's pretty good. But because of the repression on rates, is banks are looking for reasons to push money out. And that will include for small businesses that I wouldn't, would not have been the case two years ago. Now, they may end up being bad credit decisions, but we won't know until the next downturn. You've got a couple other slides that I just wanted to, as we think about banks, there are maybe three levers to think about. One is the return on assets. And this is, I'm looking at the long-term long-term slide. And you can see the uh, from the, the 90s into the 2000, the, we, we just did not have a cyclical downturn. If Alan Greenspan were commenting on it, he might call that the great moderation. And since the crisis, earnings have rebounded, but at a lower level. So what used to uh, maybe a, 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 a good return on assets pre-crisis, let's say 1.2%, 1.3% if you're a really high performer. Today, it's about 1%. And uh, we've got a, I've got a slide in there which shows various size banks, pre-crisis, post-crisis, and you can see where the return on assets are lower and the return on equity is lower, the margins down. And then if you look at, if we'll look at the slide that shows capital ratios, so capital as a percent of assets, and the core capital ratio we look at in the banking system is leverage ratio. You can see, interestingly, over the last 20 years or so, the industry has been building capital. Um, I don't think that's a bad thing. We are significantly much better capitalized than Europe, which is a good thing in this country. But as it relates to an investor, there's a lower return on equity. And, and you can look at the slide. If we look at the slide, which shows the long-term return on equity over the years, it's much lower than it was pre-crisis. And that's a function of financial repression. And then secondly, a function of regulations that are requiring banks to hold more capital. Switching gears slightly, we have excess reserves at the Federal Reserve, well in excess of $2 trillion. It doesn't seem to be yep. falling. Uh, comments on what is going on that is driving it and um, what we can expect? Yeah, well, that's, uh, if we had, so so back to the our three, three circles from our first or second slide, and if Main Street was in need of more loans, if, there, if this economy was hotter, we would see the banks draw those reserves down. So I don't have a slide of the Federal Reserve balance sheet, but the reserves, you can think of the reserves as the Fed's a deposit that a bank might make, um, Chase or Bank of America is their excess cash that they don't have reason to lend out they don't want to put it in the bond market. They've got all the bonds they want. It's sitting at the Fed where the Fed's paying them 25 basis points. And so the Fed has uh, bought bonds from, uh, from the banks to create the reserves. So if the economy were to heat up, we'll see the banks draw the cash down and lend it into the economy. And then the Fed presumably would sell bonds to to uh, uh, create the cash to, to transfer over to the banks. 
but in, in, in effect, it's just simply sitting there. So we've gone through this quantitative easing, the various permutations of it. The Fed has built up its balance sheet. And at least from a government statistical perspective, we haven't seen inflation. I know there's inflation everywhere. But to the extent, let's go with the government stats, why haven't we seen a ton of inflation? Well, these reserves are sitting there. And if the economy were hot, they'd be drawn down. And, the, and then this money, just this really freewheeling money flowing through the Main Street economy would, uh, would flow, I think, very quickly. In 2010, Dennis Lockhart, the, I believe it was 2010, it could have been 2011, and I can track down the note and send it to you if you want. He spoke to the Nashville, I guess it was the Nashville CFA Society, and he was very emphatic. I guess the Fed had probably just started QE2 at the time, or maybe it was Operation Twist. And he was very emphatic and said, the Fed will never, ever monetize the debt. Well, that's what quantitative easing has been. The, the, the Fed has, in effect, created money, the reserves, if you will, to buy the bonds from the primary dealers. That action is recorded, if you will, on the Fed balance sheet. It sits there today. I think we'll never be able to unwind it unless the federal government figures out a way to run a structural surplus, and then, and then they could unwind it, if you will. But the Fed has been drafted to support the economy, maybe in a perverse way that you and I might think, but they've been drafted, and I suspect they're going to be drafted in a few years to fund the massive growth and entitlement spendings we'll see in this country. Jeff, we're uh, running out of time. What, cons- what are your primary concerns with sustained low interest rates and a long-term continuing policy or policies of financial repression? Well, we're, the, the loss recognition is delayed. So it's an artificial, it's an artificial world, and maybe it always has been. You know, I guess after World War II, until we had the Treasury Accord, where the Fed became somewhat independent again in 52, is and we had financial oppression through the 30s and through World War II out of necessity and then really through the Korean War. Is But it's a delay of loss recognition. There is mal, to the extent we talk about malinvestment of tau commercial real estate uh, being a bigger piece of the economy than maybe it should. That is all a credit risk within the banking system. So one day there'll be a reckoning whether the whether the air can be let out of the balloon slowly. Um, don't know. It didn't happen last time, but it it's simply a, a buildup of risk and an attempt by the central authorities, if you will, to guide the economy and 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 the banks straddle it and and the balance sheets reflect risks that aren't always apparent in any given quarter or any given year's financial statements. Jeff, what keeps you up at nights? Oh, I tend I tend to sleep well. I, you know, I I would be more concerned about a a dramatic slowdown in the economy. Short rates are at zero. Um, you know, if the economy really heated up and maybe we saw government inflation pick up, that's probably a scenario that'll be easier to manage. Banks probably will be okay with that. There'll be some with some uh, large unrealized losses in their bond portfolios, but they can work with that. It's the what is more of the European scenario. The economy slows down. The Fed takes short rates negative. Let's say the 10-year goes to 1%. And in terms of thinking about being an investor in a bank, you come back to the question, how do you earn a spread on that? Well, you don't. And some banks will have fee businesses that create an offset. You've got a nice one in Boston, Boston Financial Private. Um, but most are traditional uh, spread lenders, and we've seen consolidation in the industry forced in part because of this interest rate regime we have. In that type scenario, it will have to accelerate it. It will uh, the community banks that service uh, a small town America around this country will be in uh, dire straits, maybe a tad too strong but they are merging right now because of the regulatory hassles they're having to deal with and these declining margins becomes all the more pronounced in that type scenario. I'm looking at 
all of the regional feds uh, reports in the last 30 days and they're all showing significant slowdown and you know we're all well aware aware of the degree of slowdown we're seeing globally so i i i share your concerns that i i think that is uh, not a, a very strong possibility actually yeah well, so would agree so one thing uh, thinking about banks and these cycles is so the bond market has been giving us a heads up that the economy is slowing the yield curve and i've got a slide at the end which will show how low rates are but the yield curve is still steep relative to history but it's not as steep as it was a year ago if we look at the spread between the 10 year and the 2 year and that when that flattens that has historically been a sign that the economy is slowing doesn't necessarily mean recession but it has been it has very much been giving the traditional indication of a slowing economy what's interesting though gordon in terms of thinking about banks and i talked about lending and broadening out is the lending to main street is late cycle so that's not necessarily the two aren't necessarily contradictory is that main street economy is sort of the last to turn up and the last to go down if you will uh the 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 capital markets are the first to sense trouble and usually the first to turn around we saw that in 09 where the capital markets pivoted in 09 bank financials and losses didn't peak until 2010 yeah exactly right i look at the s&p i see that we've had two consecutive quarters of down revenues on the top line negative growth that means we're in a revenue recession um we have it in earnings except that it's hidden with earnings per share because of the massive amount of buybacks that have been going on that are that are inflating the numbers but it's uh, the, the 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 evidence is there for anybody who yeah, cares to look at it and you know it's always the equity markets by the way that is the tail on the um, end of the dog agreed. the last two agreed and liquidity is a powerful um, thing including in Jeff, the capital any markets any class messages you'd like yeah. to leave with yeah. our uh, investors well no i just uh, I, i think in terms of investors and thinking about banks and just structurally they're not going to make as much money as they used to it just is what it is and it's it's probably better to think about earnings multiples on normalized earnings rather than book multiples because the return on equities are lower if you're an investor in up the capital structure and preferred or debt the margin of safety is much better than say pre-crisis because the banks run with a lot more common equity than they did pre-crisis and would completely agree with you that in other within parts of the bond market the CLO market for instance CLO equity sub tranches have gone bidless this summer very similar to sub sub prime CDOs the lower tranches of uh, those types of CDOs pre crisis where they started to go bidless in the summer of 07 just Jeff yeah there you, there are remarkable correlations to be seen right now that are that are actually truly a frightening could you uh, tell our listeners how they could learn more about your writings and mercer and also uh, your recent article on contrasting the bond market with the equity markets to specifically uh, bill uh, gross and uh, warren buffett in terms of uh, ability to achieve returns yeah well and feel feel free to post that if you want as part of this um yeah so so I write a column for SNL financial now it is behind a paywall but it's called national notes so so your your viewers who are finance who are deep into the financials should have access to SNL I do post uh on Twitter about every 2 weeks I'll post my writings there under Jeff K Davis 1 and certainly one can go to Mercer Capital we have a lot of content but you can find it on the website smercercapital.com and then just do a search for national notes and it'll turn up also be happy to link in with folks uh uh via LinkedIn so Jeff Davis at Mercer Capital Jeff thanks for your time great discussion we'll have to have you back again All right thank you very much take care